Howdy guys, welcome to Cliff Notes Travel and the recap for The Amazing Race Season 32, Episode 2. Welcome aboard to all of y'all. Now, just as a refresher from Episode 1, we lost the Kentucky buddies, Nathan and Cody, who were the last ones to check in. We're now down to 10 teams. Also from the first leg of the race, we see that the married parents, Hung and Chi, were the winners of the last stage. But keep in mind, when everyone left from Trinidad to come to this week's race, they were all on the same flight. So everyone's starting tied for first, tied for last, as they compete in Bogota, Colombia. I've been to Colombia. It's an amazing country. It's very mountainous. It's a very beautiful country, friendly people as well. Uh, but just as, as a bit of background, it has had political issues in the past. I'm sure most of y'all are aware of it. The first time I went to Bogota, probably about 15 years ago or so, uh, the country was at war with drug cartels, right-wing paramilitary groups, uh, not a safe environment, military everywhere. Uh, I wasn't allowed to, to leave the city limits under any circumstances whatsoever, uh, Bogota city limits. And I had to be careful at any time when I left my hotel room. Uh, just as an FYI, because I couldn't leave my hotel room, I, I ate in the fancy schmancy hotel restaurant that was there. It's the first time, maybe the, the last time, maybe the only time, first time I ever ate snails, buttered, still in the shell. And, but you know what? They were delicious. They, they tasted kind of similar to, to mushrooms and oysters combined and, and were just fantastic. So had a, had a nice little uh, delicacy while I was there in Columbia the first time, but it was kind of a scary city to be in back then. And yet as scary as the, the first time I was in Bogota was, when I returned about five years ago or so, everything was resolved, peace treaties, everything worked out. The country had opened back up and I was able to visit plenty of rural spots in the country without fear or worry whatsoever. Plenty of restaurants, nightlifes, uh, amazing how quickly a country can change uh, as Colombia did. Uh, on my last trip, uh, I got to throw this in as well. I'm on my last trip, the highlight was watching a street performer who operated outside my uh, hotel. Every night he would stand on a street corner and he would juggle bicycles. Now, not juggling on bicycles, but actually juggling bicycles. 10 speed, some little BMX bicycles. He would rest one bicycle on his forehead while he took two other bicycles and passed them from, from hand to hand, spun them on their wheels, just did some amazing things with these big old bicycles. I, it's amazing the ingenuity of people who are trying to make a little money. And this street performer earned everything, uh, deserved everything that he earned juggling those, those bicycles. Certainly can't be entertained in the evenings uh, while I was there. So uh, yeah, I love Columbia, it's a fantastic place. So let's talk about the race itself over the next few minutes. Well, as soon as the teams land, it looks like it was early to late evening, uh, but it's definitely in the evening. They all race through the airport as we always see them do. Uh, they quickly try to find taxis, hop in these taxis, and they're racing for a huge salt mine that's located about 40 miles or so to the northeast of the city itself. I didn't realize that Columbia has a huge salt industry trade. They have these huge salt mines. Well, they're heading to apparently one of the biggest ones in the world, at least the biggest ones in, in Columbia. Uh, once they get there, they find out that the twist to this particular leg of the race is that inside these mines, they have to search, I think they said a couple of acres worth of mine, and they have to find hourglasses that are hidden all throughout this mine. Some of them say 10 minutes, some of them say 20 minutes. Now, these hourglasses can be used to delay another team later on in the race. You can force another team to wait either 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Uh, so obviously, you want to have the longer length hourglass to, to impact the other team's worst but you have to find them first. And, and some of them were easy to find, some of them were a little more difficult. And here's the kicker. You had to find one of these hourglasses before you could sign up for a departure time to move on to the next leg of the race, uh, which was the next morning. And of the 10 teams left, there were five departure slots that left at six o'clock in the morning and five that left at 6.30 in the morning. So you had to find your hourglass and then you could sign up for a slot. And of course, everyone wants to sign up for, for the earlier slot, give them a 30 minute lead on, on the other half of, of the racers. Uh, so with that in mind, we had some teams like the volleyball players, the football players, they're talking a lot about how it's really important to find one of these 20 minute hourglasses so they can penalize the, another team as much as possible. So they spend a lot of time looking for one of these hourglasses. But I absolutely disagree with that strategy. I think at this point, the, the entire objective, you don't want to finish last in this stage of the race and potentially get eliminated. So the top priority really should be make sure you get on one of those first five slots, regardless of which hourglass you may actually have. 
And that's what the married parents do. They say, they get in, they meet, they'll say, we don't care. Just grab the first hourglass we find 10 minutes or 20 minutes. It doesn't matter. Let's just get one of those early departure slots. And that's what they do. So they grab an hourglass. It turns out it's 10 minutes. They say, we don't care. So they get their names on the departure list to leave it at six o'clock, which I think is a proper strategy. I got to say, this team of married parents, Hung and Chi, they are surprising me. They won the first leg of the race. Now they've gotten to the salt mines first. They've gotten their names on the departure list first. They've got it figured out. I think they're, they're going to really do well throughout this race. Uh, once everyone has picked, uh, found an hourglass, signed up for the departure time, either 6 or 6.30, they all have to spend the night in sleeping bags inside the mine, which it looks kind of cool. But this is the interesting part of the amazing race that, that we rarely get to see. And that's the teams all, when they're not racing, during the delays, overnights, things like that, they all are hanging out together when they aren't racing. I would think this would be a really important time to develop relationships, alliances, get to know everyone. You better be as friendly as possible and, and really, really build the, the networks with the other teams because you never know when you may need some help from them uh, to help, help you survive to the next leg of the race. So they all spend the night in the uh, salt mine and sleeping bags. The next morning, they all are up again at 6 or 6.30. Uh, they get to leave the mine, turn in their, their clues, pick up a new clue. And it turns out that the next stage of the race consists of them walking or, or running to, to the nearby town. They don't show how far away the town is, but it doesn't look like it's too far away. Uh, and once they get there, they have to race up to the bell tower of, of a famous church that's in the town, grab either a, a gold art piece, some kind of little raft, a little art piece, or grab an emerald sample uh, from the top of that bell tower. And then they have to rush to a taxi and, and rush back to Bogota to turn in either the art or the emerald and get their next clue. Uh, the gold and the emeralds are right together, right next to each other. There's no explanation which is best to, to take. Which one do you want? Uh, it's kind of random at this point in time. The only strategy that I can envision is that if I was there with the other people towards the front, I think I would try to grab the, the same item as everyone else so that you could all work together and help make sure that, that the teams at the front stay at the front. So that's, that's what I would have done if I was one of these teams. And sure enough, the first five teams who've left early, they all talked to each other and decided that they're going to try to help each other stay ahead of the five teams that were at that 630 departure. So I think that's a fantastic strategy. So they're heading back to Bogota at this point and they hit horrible traffic. Bogota has, has really miserable traffic. Uh, traffic was so bad the first time I was there that cars were only allowed on the road on every other day, depending on whether your license plate ended in an odd or even number determined which days of the week you can actually drive your vehicle. The other times, the other days you had to leave it parked. So uh, traffic's miserable. Uh, we used to go out of our way to avoid rush hour through the city because it was so bad. We would leave it four in the morning or, or delay our, our, our trips, things like that. It's really bad traffic. And these teams all discovered it is miserable. Uh, now, one thing I learned from watching this episode of Amazing Race, one, speaking Spanish is certainly important to communicate with your taxi drivers, to ask for directions, et cetera. And having a good taxi driver, as we see over and over again in the Amazing Race, is so vital, it's so important. Uh, the Olympic athletes, Kelly and LaVon, they're in a taxi that gets lost the driver's cell phone turns out it's dead because he doesn't have a charging cable, so he can't even look up navigation aids or anything else. It takes them forever to find the place where they have to turn in their emerald sampling and get their next clue. As a result, they and the team of sisters, uh, Kaylin and Haley, are the last ones to complete this task. You know, the thing is, just one little screw up like this, it may not be your fault, it's just the taxi's fault, but one little screw up can end your entire race. So yeah, unfortunately that they had a taxi, it just wasn't helping them out. Now I did notice one thing that was very interesting in terms of strategies. The Olympic athletes, when they turned in their emerald piece, they left their backpacks in the taxi while the sisters took their backpacks with them. Uh, which is better? If you leave the backpacks in the taxi, it makes it more likely that the taxi will wait for you. And you should be able to run a little bit faster, complete your, your task a little bit faster. But if that taxi leaves, if they decide they don't wait for, wait for you and they leave with your backpack, you're in trouble because then you have no clothes for the cold weather environments or anything else. So you're certainly taking a little bit of a risk when you leave anything behind in a taxi, but they do it and it appears that the taxi did indeed wait for them. So it worked out for them. Uh, eventually 
all of the teams do make it back. They turn in their gold or emeralds into either a little plaza where the emerald brokers were or a little museum where, uh, where a guy's collecting the gold samples, uh, gives them their clue to the next stage of the race, race. Turns out they have to head to circus school. For that, that looked kind of fun. I was, I was impressed with that. Uh, but before they can go in, there's a yield box that can be used with the hourglass. Remember, everyone got either a 10 uh, minute or 20 minute hourglass. At this point, if you want, you can play your hourglass. You can yield a team that hasn't reached that yield box yet and make them wait either 10 or 20 minutes to, to punish them, to help you with the game itself. Now for the early teams, I think it makes zero sense to use it. You'll only make another team mad at you. And I think that sometimes, some seasons, you can only use a, a yield box once. So you don't wanna waste it at this point in time. There's no reason to use it if you already are, are near the front of the pack. It's not gonna make, uh, make a difference. But for teams near the back, using a yield on another team that's even further behind you could be huge. And we're gonna see how that works here in just a second. Uh, eventually, the sisters, Kaylin and Haley, who were in second to last place, uh, they get to the yield box. They choose not to yield uh, the, the last place team, which are the Olympic athletes. They could have forced the Olympic athletes to wait an extra 10 or 20 minutes. I don't know which hourglass I had. That was a perfect time. To, if you're ever gonna use a, a yield, this was the perfect time to do it. But they didn't use it. I think they're just trying to be friendly. They didn't wanna make anyone mad. They didn't use it. That is incredibly dangerous. Uh, it could ruin your whole game as a result. Now the circus competition, it looks kind of tough at first. You have to get spun in a wheel, a wheel of death, or spun, get all dizzy and all. Uh, and then you have to walk on a tight rope while holding a tray with wine and, and then some wine glasses. Uh, my body isn't designed for tight rope walking. I, I, I may have had some issues with that one. Not, not the heights, that's no big deal, but walking across that tight rope may have been a little difficult. But it does seem like there's a rope to hold on to you to help keep you balanced, which makes it a lot easier. And as it turns out, most of the teams don't seem to have a lot of problems uh, with this particular challenge. Uh, so once they've completed that, they get their clue on to the final challenge of this episode of the race. They have to go find, uh, go to a little car area where there's a bunch of dump trucks and they have to decorate their dump truck to look like the one that's already been done. Banners, seat covers, mats, all kinds of decorations all over this dump truck. And there's an air horn as well that they have to hook up. The, the clue specifically says you then have to hook up the air horn, uh, but you have to pay attention to detail because they were sticklers. If you didn't have every single banner put on just right, if you didn't hook up the air horn, then you would get a big no from, from the manager and, and have to just keep doing it over and over again. Uh, so. The clue, as I mentioned, the clue specifically says you have to hook up the air horn. If you skipped reading that, you're in trouble. And that hurts several teams in this challenge, uh, especially the, the dating guys, Will and James. And just as an FYI, uh, I found out that Will is from Texas A&M. So I've got a new favorite team that I'm cheering for in the race, the dating couple of Will and James. They don't know that, that they have to hook up the air horn and they they try to keep working on their dump truck. Finally, one of them reads the clue and realizes they missed this, this very significant part of what they have to do. Uh, so they now know what they have to what they have to fix. Now, what I discovered from this particular part of the challenge, when you discover that you've done something wrong, that something is missing, don't yell it out where the other teams can hear you uh, like Will and James did at this point. They said loudly, oh my God, we've got to hook up the horn. Well, as soon as they do that, the dating couple, Leo and, and Alana, overheard and they were having issues of their own. They couldn't figure out. So they immediately said, oh, we forgot the horn too. So they go and hook up the horn. Uh, so again, uh, Will and James, if they hadn't said anything, they would be that much further ahead of the dating couple, but they talked too loud. I know a little bit about being overheard talking too loud. All right, so, so they, they do that. Now, Leo and Alana have overheard Will and James. So now they've hooked up their horn. They've gotten their clue. As they turn to leave, they go over and they whisper to the sisters, Kaylin and Haley say, look, You've got to hook up the horn as well. Don't forget to hook up your horn. Strategy wise, telling another team when you're that far behind everyone else, it's very dangerous. Yes, it helps relationships. It might help you in the future uh, because that team may help you out a little bit on down the road. But when you are near the very back, there is always the risk that the team you help could end up passing you, stay alive, and you're the one that's last place at the pit stop and you go home. So you got to be careful when you're at the very end about trying to help the teams. Yeah, I know it's, it makes you feel good to do it, but you could be at risk of, of getting eliminated if you do that too much. So they finally all fix their air horns. It's a race to the finish. They find a park in, in the city. They're racing to find Phil first. Uh, the winners of stage two of the race, 
Hung and Chi, the married parents, they won the first leg. They win the second leg again. This team we've got to watch out for. I think they could just, uh, they're going to win some more challenges on down the road. They're, they're doing fantastic. Uh, so I am impressed. So that's who won the competition. So who came in last place and were they eliminated? Well, as the final team, it, it turned out it, it was uh, the Olympic athletes, Kaylee and, and LaVon uh, finished last. From start to finish, they just didn't do well. Uh, they had a bad taxi that got lost, took forever in the traffic. They didn't read their clue about hooking up the horn, which really put them behind everyone else. We don't know for certain just how far behind they finished every, from everyone else, but it, it looked like it was a little bit of time. Uh, it's a shame we didn't get to see them utilize their athletic ability more uh, because I think in, in some challenges, they're obviously super athletes. They would have dominated. We just didn't get to see it. Uh, they stayed at the back throughout both the first leg and the second leg. It just didn't work out for them. And it turns out it's another elimination leg. So we are losing the Olympic athletes. It takes us now from 10 teams down to nine teams that are still left on the race. And that's it for episode two. It looks like they're going to go somewhere in the Amazon area uh, for episode three. I'm really looking forward to it, but we're down to nine teams. Guys, appreciate it. We're going to see what happens next week. We'll have some more travel stories to tell. Y'all have a great one. SKD 143. Happy travels, guys. Bye.